When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, an opportunity was presented which had the potential to elevate the new Russian economy on the world stage. However, no one would have expected that the multi-million dollar project would end in disaster. At Jakarta's Halim Pernakusuma International Airport, pushing back on a hazy, dry season's day is a twin, narrow-bodied jet. But this is no mainstream Airbus A320 or Boeing 737. It's a Sukhoi 95B Superjet. And today, the 9th of May 2012, it's conducting a demonstration flight for potential customers. Sukhoi was created in the year 2000, tasked with developing and selling new commercial aircraft out of post-Soviet Russia. Identifying a need for a longer range regional jet, the first project Sukhoi undertook was an aircraft to rival the likes of Embraer's E-Jet and Bombardier's CRJs, with the Russian government allocating $46 million to aid in its development. The Superjet is in fact slightly larger than most other regionals, with five abreast seating, and this variant, the 95, designed to seat 98 passengers. It's in Jakarta, Indonesia, as part of its Welcome Asia demonstration tour. Demonstration flights being critical to a new airframe's release to market, allowing manufacturers to network with buyers and proving the plane's performance to the airlines. Designated flight number 36801, the Superjet taxiing for runway 06 is on its second and final demonstration flight of the day. In the cockpit are two experienced Russian pilots, both with test pilot certifications. They each have a variety of type ratings under their belt, while the first time the captain piloted the Superjet was on its maiden flight in 2008. The jump seat is also occupied, with a potential customer sitting behind the pilots in the flight deck. Back in the cabin are further potential clients, with 14 passengers on board from the Indonesian airline Sky Aviation, while 5 reporters, an American pilot, and the head of Sukhoi Civil Aircraft are also included in the 45 people on board. It's going to be a quick journey with the pilot's flight plan showing a 20 mile leg to the southwest before turning around and returning to the field. There is some terrain around, with several mountains located to the south of Halim. The minimum safe altitude within 25 miles is 6,900 feet, while outside this ring is 13,200 feet. The weather for the demonstration flight is fairly good. Winds are light, while the temperature is getting up to 33 degrees Celsius. There are some low layers of cloud, while haze is slightly reducing visibility. Not a problem for Sukhoi 36801, which is operating under the instrument flight rules. Sukhoi 36801, Halim Tower. Maintain runway heading after takeoff. Then turn right to intercept radial 200 from the Halim VOR. Climb to 10,000 feet. Cleared for takeoff, runway 06. Intercept radial 200. Climb to 10,000 feet. Cleared for takeoff, Sukhoi 36801. Sukhoi 36801, make the turn after passing 2,000 feet, please. Roger, 36801. Sukhoi 36801 and its numerous VIPs take off at 2.19 p.m. local time. They turn to intercept the 200 radial as the brand new, lightly loaded jet rockets up to 10,000 feet. Upon reaching their cruise altitude, the pilots contact Jakarta Approach. Jakarta Approach, Sukhoi 36801, maintaining 10,000 feet. Established on radial 200 degrees from Halim VOR. Sukhoi 36801, Roger, you're identified. Maintain 10,000 feet, continue to the area. Maintain 10,000 feet, Sukhoi 36801. By clearing them to continue to the area, what the air traffic controller means is that 36801 is approved to operate to the Atang Sanjara Training Area, or Bogor Area, meaning a training area used by military aircraft, located 17 miles to the southwest of Halim. However, on the flight plan provided to the pilots, there's no reference to any such area. They don't even have any charts which depict it, 
so they continue on their course of 200 degrees, as they did on their previous demonstration flight earlier in the day. Two minutes later, another peculiar event occurs. Takora approach, Sukhoi 36801. Request descent to 6,000 feet. Approach, Sukhoi 36801. Request descent 6,000. 6,000, copied. Descending to 6,000 feet. The busy air traffic controller, who is also handling 13 other aircraft, barely has enough time to approve the descent. The pilots have decided they need to be at a lower level as they are expecting to land straight in on runway 06, giving them minimal room to descend on final, unlike on the previous flight where they landed on the opposite runway, 24. Dark cloud ahead. The first officer is referring to cloud ahead on their current course. Eventually, they're going to descend into it as they start down to 6,000 feet. We are going to land on the opposite runway. What's the reason for the descent? We're preparing to land for runway 06 at Halim. Otherwise, we'd be too high for the approach. If we're too high, another method would be to make an orbit. Soon after this conversation occurs, the flight is already 20 miles from Halim and at the end of its leg. The aircraft is too high to turn inbound for a straight-in approach, so the pilots will soon request a right-hand orbit from air traffic control, getting them down to 6,000 feet before they turn back to the runway. Approach, Sukhoi 36801. Request to make a right orbit in our current position. Sukhoi 36801, approved. Orbit to the right. The orbit is approved, and the captain uses the heading selector to ease the aircraft around. The plan is to continue the turn to line up with runway 06. As they descend all the way down to 6,000 feet, however, 36801 is now below the 25 mile minimum safe altitude published for Halim. Terrain clearance is not assured, but at some point, the Sukhoi Superjet enters the cloud. You can see here, the aircraft has the ability to fly, holding a pattern on the FMC. Yes. Sometimes you can see the ground down here, through the cloud. 6,000, Altstar. The captain's call confirms to the crew that the aircraft is leveling off at 6,000. He winds the heading bug around to 150, now they're established in the right turn, giving him time to demonstrate some further features of the superjet. The TAWS system can show you the terrain on the screens here. Okay, I see. This kind of information is not necessary at the moment. Yeah, it's flat. The captain is demonstrating the Terrain Awareness Warning System, or TAWS, to the jump seat passenger. TAWS can display a visual representation of the terrain around the aircraft, aiding the pilot's situational awareness. It also predicts the path of the aircraft up to two minutes ahead of its current position. Should it detect an upcoming collision or near miss, it alerts the pilots, prompting them to climb and sometimes turn to avoid terrain, giving them ample time to react. As the pilots and jump seater examine the terrain display, the aircraft is pointing to the northeast towards the Java Sea. Thus all they see is flat terrain. So the captain switches the display function off, perhaps believing that all the terrain in their current area is flat. For the following minute, the pilots and jump seater engage in a conversation about fuel consumption as they continue the turn to a heading of 174. Request a right turn for the approach, please. Would you like to return to Halim or make another orbit? What is your intention? Return to Halim or another orbit? What? Return to Halim or another orbit. We'll make the approach. The aircraft begins to roll wings level, heading to the south, as the pilots attempt to calculate a heading back to Halim. I'll make the request after the turn is completed. Uh, request it now, please. Hmm, what heading would that be? I can check in the legs page down here. Look at the legs page? Which one? I can't find it. Let me see if I can get it off the outbound heading. I'm not sure. Determining a heading back to Halim is proving easier said than done, 
the captain decides that 020 will be good enough. Heading 020 to Halim is okay. Okay. On heading 020 for VOR approach, request to Jakarta approach that we want a heading of 020 and descent to 1600 feet for the VOR DME approach. With the plan now in place, the captain moves the heading selector to 325 and the aircraft begins a shallow turn back towards Halim. However, with the leg to the south extended so much, the aircraft is now flying outside the 25 mile ring from Halim and into an area of mountainous terrain. Just request quickly. Terrain, okay. Terrain, terrain, terrain. Pull up. Pull up. Pull up. What is that? Terrain, terrain, terrain. Maybe database. The alerts you just heard were coming from Tours. It's detecting terrain ahead. However, the captain, likely believing that the terrain around them is flat, inhibits the warning system. The gear not down advisory only ever sounds when the aircraft is less than 800 feet from the ground with the landing gear not extended. The captain, possibly beginning to realize the magnitude of the issue, begins slowly pulling back on the side stick. What is that? Autopilot off. I Before the pilots or anybody on board the superjet fully realize what's happening, it slams into the side of Mount Salak, an eroded volcano with an elevation of 7,254 feet. All 45 people on board die and the aircraft is destroyed. Sukhoi 36801 is classified as a controlled flight into terrain accident. CFIT is one of the rarest accident types in aviation, but it's also one of the deadliest. So in the wake of the crash, let's take a look at six of the contributing factors and how they led to the disastrous outcome. One of the critical events which led to the crash was the pilot's decision to descend below the 6,900 foot minimum safe altitude to 6,000 feet. As the investigation looked at the information available to the pilots, it found that there was missing terrain information on the charts provided to them, with spot heights of only some of the mountains depicted, and no representation of the Bogor training area. There were better charts available, however, these weren't carried on board the aircraft. One which the pilots were surely referencing though, was this one, the VOR approach chart. The pilots were using it for guidance back to Halim, and it did indicate the relevant MSAs. The accident report doesn't explain how the pilots missed them, but likely their high workload and distraction were significant factors. Distraction with the prolonged conversation with the jump seat passenger also seemed to cause a lapse by the captain who neglected to continue the full orbit, instead ending up on a southerly heading towards mountainous terrain, with the pilots ignoring and then turning off what they thought were spurious alerts from the tours. Earlier we looked at a flight plan error which created confusion surrounding 36801's clearance. This is a minor issue on the surface, but it also led to another contributing factor. The aircraft type on the flight plan was listed as an SU-30, the same code given to the fighter aircraft developed by Sukhoi. Air traffic control therefore believed that it was flying to the Bogor area for a test flight and when it requested descent to 6,000 feet, the controller assumed that it was eligible to fly at low altitudes, with no minimum vectoring altitudes required to be complied with. ATC's minimum safe altitude warning system could have alerted the controller, and therefore the pilots, of their proximity to Mount Salak, but it didn't provide any terrain alerts at any stage. Then, when Sukhoi 36801 disappeared off of ATC's radar screen, it wasn't noticed for another 24 minutes. A contributing factor to this was the overloaded controller, who had a total of 14 aircraft to deal with, as well as filling the additional roles of assistant and supervisor. All these contributing factors led to Sukhoi 36801 impacting Mount Salak, 6,000 feet above sea level. As it collided with the 85 degree slope, most of the wreckage slid to the bottom of the valley, about 500 meters below the impact point. Everybody on board was killed and the aircraft was destroyed by the impact force as well as post-crash fire. 
Following the crash in 2012, sales of the Sukhoi Superjet have been slow, with maintenance costs and operational issues resulting in the jet reaching just one third of the productivity of a typical Boeing or Airbus. In March 2022, the European Union Aviation Safety Agency revoked the Superjet's airworthiness certificate as part of sanctions against Russia after its invasion of Ukraine. So the Superjet, supposed to be the game changer for post-Soviet Union Russia, never really left the ground, with the crash in 2012 being just one part of its turbulent history.